Good afternoon to you, Mr. Barabaski. Thank you. Not everybody is so clever as you are. <laughs> Tell me something. Who is Tokomak? Is it a beast? Is it a tender doe? A tender swan? What is it? The Tokomak. A tokomak yeah. is, a, is a Russian invention. It is. Uh, yeah. So Tokomak is, uh, say, a way uh, that has been devised by a Russian scientist uh, in order to reproduce uh, a reaction that allows to reach very high temperature. And this high temperature, about 150 million degrees, it's similar to the temperature, well, actually, it's hotter. Of the sun. It's hotter than the temperature that takes place in the sun. And at this temperature, uh, some nuclei, uh, particularly those of hydrogen, mm -hmm. uh, fuse. They merge and they become uh, different elements. So it is a nuclear reaction called fusion. It is the nuclear reaction that powers the largest fraction of the universe, the stars. So we try to do that. In, it's, like, it's like a big magnetic pizza oven that allows to warm up this soup to very high temperature. That ah. is in a common. I'd rather disagree with the people who are afraid of nuclear energy. Uh, but the word nuclear provokes sentiments. Mm -hmm. Here I understand we're talking about a technology which is nuclear, mm -hmm. but which does not involve nuclear waste mm -hmm. and radiation. Am I right? You are right to a certain extent in the sense that the reaction itself uh, does not produce a waste uh, which is per se radioactive, mm -hmm. while nuclear fission uh, does produce a waste which is per se itself radioactive because the fission products are radioactive. But generally speaking, uh, much of the nuclear reaction uh, deriving from fusion do not produce that. But to be fair, uh, there is a certain degree of radioactivity involved. There are neutrons produced, and these neutrons then tend to interact with matter uh, surrounding the, the tokamak, and that in itself is inducing some activation and radioactivity, per se. But only some, as you say. So some, yeah. once we are, well, once we are dry, once there's no oil and gas left and coal and whatever, this is the future of energy. Well, I think that personally, I think that uh, we should not wait uh, that we are run out of coal and gas, because if we wait that long, we will be in deeper trouble than we are. Of course, we depend on oil. And Don't say things like that in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say what I think is right, you know, in the, the world is, is, of course, yeah, but in Russia, you, you have a very strong history of nuclear power. But so, okay. the tokamak was invented here, as you said. And, uh, and so I think that I believe personally that nuclear power as, as a whole is one of the important sources that we should rely upon in the future. And the nuclear fusion, uh, it's one of them. It's one, say, of the most advanced, the most complex and most difficult to achieve, but that doesn't mean we should give up on that. So we will try to, to achieve that as well. Uh, Tokamak as a beast, or as a tender dough, was invented here, but then you have this uh, project of yours called ITER. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit more about it. How does it work? How does it function? So ITER is an interna ITER means International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, and it's a project that was conceived in the 80s, in the mid 80s, actually as a consequence of the Cold War, uh, or as a product of the end of the Cold War, mm -hmm. conceived by uh, Secretary Gorbachev and um, Ronald Reagan, the president at the time of the United States. And Mitterrand of France. And Mitterrand eventually, yes. It was, uh, was a joint project conceived as a project of peace, as a project of cooperation between uh, different cultures and countries to, uh, yes, address one of the most difficult technological problems that at that time mankind foresaw. Forse so. And it is still, I think, one of the most difficult technological projects that we have in hand. And with time, um, so it started, uh, yes, with the US, the USSR, then Russia, and then Euratom, the European Union, and all the countries represented in the Euratom, and then Japan. And then 
what happened is that uh, China and India and South Korea joined in the early 2000s. And so this is where we stand. We have now seven big members, in reality about 33 nations, cooperating since decades now on this research, big research infrastructure. How do I prove to our viewers that we are talking in the year 2024? Mm -hmm. Because you are saying some of unbelievable things now. Mm -hmm. uh, so many things have been shut down uh, with Russian participation. ITER is going on and forward and forward. Mm -hmm. How do you manage to do it? I think it's in the, I don't need to do much about that. It is in the DNA of the, of the project. You know, the project is, has been built like that. It is, I said, a project of peace. It remains as such. It is a project where those that participate, they come from different natures, different nations, different cultures, but there is a common, a common one, sort of like an inter culture, let's say, <laughs> like, like another nation. And, they focus and they cooperate. I think it's the focus on a very important objective that align people's mind, and it just works. I think I don't have to do much about that. Well, I wish everyone thought like you, actually. Uh, what is exactly the Russian participation? What do the Russians do? Well, see, practically, uh, well, let's first remember about the history. Uh, Russia has been one of the founding members of this project and uh, so it, in the history has contributed tremendously in its conception and uh, then with time the project took its own shape and when the construction was decided, this was about 20 years ago in fact, it was decided to share uh, the work um, in the execution and in the delivery of components and Russia took a significant fraction, like many other members, say it's more or less equally shared with the exception that the host, which in the spe specific case of ITER now it's Europe, uh, contributes also with a lot of the civil works. But say Russia is contributing with a lot of key components, like part of the internal part of the reactor, the first wall, and uh, some one big magnet is, has been produced in Russia. It is now uh, ready to be assembled a lot of components in the plasma heating. The idea amongst that is to make sure that every one of the contributors is contributing with what they know best to do. And at the same time, they cooperate in a way where in the future, everyone will get the know-how that will allow them to build one of their own. Maybe it's with their own uh, sort of flavor, but I would say Russia has been historically one of the key innovator in fusion and in ITER in particular. What do you say to people who in this last couple of years have been closing international projects involving Russia or at least throwing Russia out of such projects? Well, what can I say? I mean, I don't want to comment on anyone else's decisions in this respect. What I can say is that in my project this is not going to happen. I, I am quite sure about that. A lot of years have passed since the launch of the project. Why has it been so slow, at least in, someone else, in the eyes of someone who is not yeah, it is, deeply involved in it is a slow. It is, it is a slow because it is complex. It is a slow because uh, so it takes a lot of effort and certainly more than what was originally foreseen. And I would say that it went through a history also, the project, uh, where, you know, either is on one side a project, on another side, it is an international organization, and the two animals mm -hmm. are different from each other. You can, yes. you can think about those, and, uh, and the project uh, tends to have a shape which is different from the one that an international organization should have. And so it went through a certain cycle. Now I think it's very much focused again on being a construction project. We have to get the job done. We have to create this research infrastructure. And so, with insight, I think that it could have been a little bit faster in its execution than it had to be. But part of the reasons for the delay was also because all this, say, melting pot of cultures had to learn how to work together mm -hmm. on a construction project, not on paper, on something extremely complex. So the ability then to solve very practical uh, difficulties 
that maybe each one of us would have been able, each one of us meaning each one of the culture that participated would have been able to solve by themselves easier. When you put it to there, they had to learn on how to do that. I think this is part of the reason. Uh, there was a project like that called JET, the Joint mm -hmm. European Taurus it was, wasn't That's it? That's right. Uh, based in the United Kingdom, which was closed after 40 years of um, functioning. Mm -hmm. um, well, okay, I understand they now co-participate in your project as well, but what, what, what would be the moment that you say, okay, we've, we've done it, to create a star on this planet, to create a sun on this planet? Yeah. Uh, what, is, what is the final result? So JET was, uh, you, you bring it up because it was a sort of a small-scale type of eater. Mm -hmm. It was mostly in the European context with some participation abroad. I had the privilege to work there for a few years, so I, I have experienced that, and it was a good training ground, if I may say. Um, here, everything is on a completely different scale, and uh, uh, eater has something particularly different compared with Jet, for example, because either will uh, achieve a thermonuclear plasma where the self-heating mm -hmm. will be significantly larger than the amount of heat we will put inside. So it's really like lighting a fire. It's really like lighting a fire for the second time in mankind. This didn't really happen in jet. In jet, we were sort of torching mm -hmm. the plasma to a point where it would produce uh, certain thermonuclear reactions, but no way, not even close to what will happen in ITER. So I think this would be the, 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 the moment in time when uh, ITER with, for many minutes, for many, say, yes, for a long duration, because many minutes it starts to become long durations in the timescales that we are dealing with, will achieve, uh, yes, the thermonuclear reactions where the output power will be hundreds of megawatts will be produced. I think this will be the, 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 you know, the defining moment. In your project, you consume enormous amounts of Wolfram, of lithium, etc. And these are materials which draw more and more attention, not only of governments, but of private companies. Uh, do you actually foresee uh, a bright future uh, for public-private partnerships in such areas, which are time-consuming, which are money-consuming, which, which could change the fate of the world? I, yes, I, I think this is a very good question. In, in recent years, as you probably know, a number of private and private-public, uh, say, initiatives have surfaced to try to address this problem, the problem of nuclear fusion. And there are a lot of bright ideas, uh, some from uh, old colleagues of mine, and I deeply respect all these initiatives. I think in, um, it is important to, to, how to say, to, to try different things. And ITER is, uh, is you know, the main line uh, to success, but I think it's good that there are so many ideas that I think most of them will probably fail, but that's part of uh, trying. You know, if you don't try, you're not going to succeed. The reason why I asked you is that I'm talking to you as a journalist and as president of the Global Energy Association, where annually we give our prize, but also annually we publish our annual report called 10 Breakthrough Ideas uh, in Energy for the Next 10 Years. And every single time that we start thinking about what these ideas would be for this year and for the next 10 years, obviously, I'm asking all of the authors to write in such a manner which would be interested for both the scientists and potential investors. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've certainly realized that it's quite often very difficult to sell uh, a scientific project to a businessman. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's very difficult to, uh, well, I think I may use the word make, make scientists to think commercially. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible? I guess it's possible uh, because some of them managed to do that. Well, some of I don't do. know if I would be in the same <laughs> league, uh, but what I can what I can say is that in the ITER project, our ambition is to try to help all these private enterprises as much as we can, because we are conscious of the fact that the ITER project has been publicly funded, so we have to give back, and ITER has a tremendous amount of knowledge, and that we can give that we can share. 
we should share. It's our duty to do that, to try to help all these private companies uh, to achieve success. And we are trying to establish a framework to do that. And uh, sometimes this knowledge is knowledge about what does work, but also about what doesn't work. Which is equally important. Which is even more important, I think. And it is, when I say it's even more important, is that the cost of failure, it's something that we should treasure. We should really own. And it doesn't often get published. As a matter of fact, it doesn't at all get published. Normally, if you try to send to a journal a story of failure, they will not like to publish it. Mm. And ma maybe you as a journalist would find this also some, somewhat difficult to sell. But in the world of research, this type of knowledge is very important, in fact. So it's not that we have a lot of stories of failure to say, but we have reasons why some paths have not been chosen, why some branches in the decisions towards engineering, we say, okay, we don't do that. And this is, this is always in the path of development. And we try to consolidate this knowledge and make it available to the, to the private sector as well. Well, very lastly, we're speaking in Russia. You are in Russia. I'm so grateful to you for having mentioned uh, all of the Russian aspects of the, of the whole thing. But I'd imagine that you came here for things other than sightseeing and just shaking heads. What brings you to Russia this time around? Well, let me say that the ITER project is, of course, located, the central part is the, where we construct it, is in the south of France. Okay, this is like a sort of international community there. But the ITER project is everywhere. The ITER project is here in Moscow, the ITER project is in St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. So I'm here in Moscow, in Troisk, at the Kurchatov, and then I will go tomorrow in Yefremov, and, and I will meet my colleagues, and I have to discuss technical matters with them. That's one objective. And the second objective is also to try uh, to meet some policymakers, and uh, some of those that provide us the fund. Uh, to move ahead and try to explain what we are doing and answer questions that they have their own, how the project is going, and they have to listen it directly and read my eyes. So this is also part of my job. Good, lovely. Uh, grazie mille, I should have said. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Spasiba.